right. That's so we are live at Leakers. I just want to confirm that we're live over in the Facebook group. Just make sure it's all showing up good. Nine times out of ten, we have, nine times out of ten, we have technical issues. So <laughs> you would think uh, tech guys would be able to. That's change. today. Let's hope today is not that day. Yeah. Let's see. Yes, confirm. We're up and running. How's it guys? How's it going today, guys? It's awesome. It's uh, can't complain. The weather is kind of good, so uh, we got the fundamentals in place for a good day. So can't complain there. And you guys, uh, you guys are in Amsterdam, correct? Yeah, we're in uh, in the Netherlands, uh, in Europe. So it's uh, six p.m. here. So are you like in the what do they call it? Like, when I think of Amsterdam, I think of red light district. Are you guys in that area or? We live there. No, it's just, no, it's uh, where the tourists uh, mostly go. Um, and it, it's it, every time when I get visitors from abroad, we have to do the red light district tour. So it's, I'm sure. I know it way too well, but not for the reasons as many people expect. Yeah. But yeah it's, uh, have you ever been there, uh, Justin? Mm -mm. Mm. No, I've been to Mexico. The only time I've been out of the country is Mexico. So oh, on, yeah. on my honeymoon. Otherwise, I stay, I stay put. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. I mean, I just just for the reference, uh, Justin, is that you know when we're talking about weather is good, it means that it's not raining. Oh, okay. And and so so you know if you're if you're familiar in the Netherlands, we're not we're not a tropical climate at all. Like Mexico is totally opposite. Like it's yeah. we do have a beach, which is great, but only if it's you know if it's warm enough. <laughs> and those like we, we we really look forward to the day that it's summer and then that day is over and then there's autumn so <laughs> when you got when you uh, one of the inside shows because you get but you guys still have like you get snow in winter right over there or not really every now and then yeah every now and then we have uh we have snow but it's it's not like in the mountains uh we do have we do we do have a lot of ice skating going on once the lakes are frozen or the canals are frozen or anything basically is frozen we put on our ice skates and we go and do some ice skating that's so that the, you just have to youtube amsterdam ice skating channels and you will see people like going crazy it's, as soon as it's possible we do a lot of ice skating yeah. on that. Yeah. and don't uh, don't uh, youtube red light district you're gonna see some other images uh <laughs> but that's uh for another time <laughs> uh all right let's jump in so you guys been in the game a long time obviously i pretty sure probably as long as I have, maybe even longer, Vincent. Um, tell us a little yeah. bit about, about yourself and then we'll get get over to Raul. Um, but tell yeah. us about yourself, what you got going on, how long you've been doing it. Um, and yeah, we'll kind of dive in and go from there. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, I talked for both of us because we pretty much, I started 10 years ago. I think Raul started like 12 years ago. So like from that time forward, we know each other from our previous AG where we both worked. Uh, we worked then, back then with big European brands like the, the Bon Prix and the Yves Rochers. So back then it was mainly a, a Google Ads agency. What uh, what they had there was where we met. And um, yeah, well, we transitioned like five, six years ago. We started for ourselves and um, up until now, we're specialized in, in helping uh, seven, eight figure brands uh, scale with, with, with Google Ads. We have done Facebook from, uh, from, uh, since 2012. Uh, up until 2015 and then again from 2017 uh, to 2019 but we stopped but we kind of wanted to focus on less is more so now just doing the google ads platform uh so it means google ads and and youtube yep uh, all right so yeah you've been you're well, i would say you're an og then so well, yeah, Raul's basically mm -hmm. i think i'm on like i think i'm 13 years so you're 12 years and we're right it's been a long time time flies doesn't it <laughs> mastodons yeah you're in mastodons <laughs> for sure yeah so if, if you guys aren't in, aren't in the group obviously these two know what they're doing uh Ro, i always get the sense that you're more specialized on the analytics side and not so much on the adword side but yeah what is your role well, in yeah what is my role i i i do i i do like to crunch data and like to find the opportunities within the the given limitations of that 
um, um, I, you know, I tend to look at data in a holistic way yep. and, you know, that's applicable to Google ads too. I mean, Google ads is, is what I grew up with basically in 2008. I mean, if we're just, you know, comparing sizes, then, you know, since 2008, I've been, been working in that same agency that Vincent, I hired Vincent back then. That's a, like a nice small detail there. Um, so, <laughs> so the, uh, uh, the uh, from that moment on, I mean, uh, back then we were happy that clients were actually not asking for top positions in Google because that was the, that was the benefit. Like, do you want to appear the number one spot in Google? Then hire us. And then, you got like the agency that we worked for that's that actually was kind of bound you know like breaking with oh you, yeah it's nice to be on number one but does it bring you more sales no like how do you know and then obviously conversion tracking became the standard only like a year or two later and that was like oh yeah that's so much better actually yeah it makes sense but those brands didn't care and there are still brands that don't care they just pull you know just throw money at the wall for exposure, huh? a so-called uh, metric that we can't really understand as data nerds in that sense. So I, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm the, the guy who likes to just jump into the, to the specifics. Uh, also a curse because it's also distracting uh, sometimes. So you have to be careful to, you know, stop doing what you're doing if you're really going into the rabbit holes. But uh, yeah, I guess you're familiar with that as well, Justin. I oh, remember yeah. our conversations where, oh yeah, do you know this? Like, yeah, it's actually very nice to know, but is it really necessary? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. And you guys just stop. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks for working with, with me on that conversions API video and getting that done. So um, yeah, you guys man. check that out. Um, good video. I had done it a different way and then I uh, ended up using your way just because it's passing a little bit more data. Um, so good stuff. Yeah, it was it was for us also like uh, tweaking back and forth because we, we got some, you, you get some notifications from Google afterwards. We had to double check, like it, it said, like check and ends conversions. We double checked it with Google and then they say, yeah, it's normal because um, what is actually happening is if you do not have a 100% match rate, you get the message that something's off. But it actually isn't off because you still have a 99.9% .9 match rate. But just for everybody to be aware, that is supposed to happen. But it was fun, uh, fun little project. I don't know that I've seen that. Uh, um, I don't know that I've seen that message, I guess, in any of our accounts. It, it should disappear after the first seven days. Uh, but we see various things with, with some clients it disappeared after a few days, other seven days. So it, it, it just depends. But as long as you follow those instructions, it should all be good. Yep. I'm trying to figure that out now for Google Tag Manager. So I'm uh, mm -hmm. trying to figure out and conquer that beast next for just clients yeah. GTM. So that'll be interesting. If you have any insight definitely. on that. One. <laughs> Not yet, but uh, if we have anything, uh, we'll definitely... Uh, What's, so when you go in there and you're setting that up, there's an option in there that says, um, uh, I think it says in, use server side, a, like server side API or use enhanced API, but you actually don't. Have you seen that in there in the option when you hit edit code? Yeah, I mean, um, yes, yes, it is. But I think it's really platform dependent. I mean, API, uh, what, what, what I think, and uh, that's something I will probably refer to more often is that, you know, Shopify and Google are really best buddies at the moment. They're really trying to collaborate. Uh, my, my, my vision is that it's based on the fact that they together, they can beat Amazon, you know, like they can really uh, challenge them. Um, and they are probably going to get to that point where they're going to implement API based uh, uh, tracking. So you actually have an even more accurate uh, um, uh, representation of the, of the data, of the conversions, and maybe your audiences, right? That's also what is, uh, what is being talked about. But yeah, um, I think it's, that's, you know, it's, it's also just more interesting for people or for, for businesses that have their own data scientists on board that can create API connections with their own backend. I mean, there is plenty of corporates that do actually have that kind of data, but for the majority of, 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 of so well, let's call them e-commerce entrepreneurs. I don't think it's going to make a huge difference or a significant difference. Uh, so I would not recommend putting too much effort Let's into see. cracking that code for yourself. That's, I'm assuming, that's the idea. I'm assuming that sales channel will probably integrate that natively eventually through Google. But that yeah. we don't use that app, but a lot of people, we find a lot of people using it. So unfortunately. Um, yeah. It's good to set start forget early, function. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No worries. Let's talk the uh, let's talk measurement. So, iOS fourteen landscape across digital 
web obviously is especially with facebook you guys read all the posts attribution not attributing um, majority of clients i would say that we've seen on facebook have had to scale back their facebook budgets we really yeah. haven't seen i don't think a tremendous impact on the google side um obviously i'm a big component that when we run facebook and we're running especially facebook when we run that in conjunction with google we can definitely tell that there's a significant uplift just across the board um they work very well hand in hand together what are you guys seeing on the the measurement piece with that with the rollout of everything kind of the last few months um how does that look for you guys um well my perspective is that from google's own the, the campaigns i didn't saw necessarily a big drop like like we saw with other people with facebook like with facebook you saw them gradually and then suddenly it was like cliff diving uh with google we haven't seen that um but it's also the reason why we now have these enhanced conversion pixel next to our regular one so we want to measure if the what the actual impact is of uh running that google's conversion api next to it to see it but from the clients that we have, we don't see a direct in Google, but like you said, the flywheel in conjunction with Facebook ads, if they scale down on Facebook ads, you do see some impact definitely on the Google ads front. So you, you want to, when that happens, um, you want to re rethink your strategy there to see how you do can keep coming up with those non-brand sales without uh, assisting the levels between Facebook and, uh, and Google. Mm -hmm. Yep. I definitely agree. Yeah. Yeah, if I can add to that, the um uh the part where you know like especially when we see clients actually decrease drastically we do see a definitely a decrease in in brand interest over time like that's that's almost inevitable but the i also think uh, we talked about it in, in at least before like i do think people like it's 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 a terrible timing right the ios 40 in that sense because we compare year over year with a, with with the corona year right COVID. oh yes um so there's always that part where people are like oh no like it's even like it's it's so much worse than last year it must be ios 14 but it's that's not only the reason why things go right. bad right. there is also simply a different outlying uh, uh seasonality that has caused a huge increase in, in e-commerce uh, uh, market last year that it's maybe not that fair to pull that can like pull that comparison right away and the panic mode i would definitely recommend people like okay wait are my front end metrics still okay like are my ctrs in place is the relevancy of my traffic is that on the front end does it make sense um then you know then yeah sure maybe your high ticket product is now more difficult to sell because people are going outdoors and they're done buying all the home deco <laughs> because they're not no longer inside you know that that is like an example uh that we talked about and, and and i guess that's something that people tend to forget or maybe just not think about yep no i definitely agree um yeah if, no, about you justin uh, uh maybe that, yeah. <laughs> do no, you see I, that yeah we're, yeah we basically see the same thing and part of that too is and part leading in my next question uh one of the big brands that we're working with um huge budgets they we recently have been working on I'm just kind of curious we've been working with google and uh doing some brand inc incrementality studies on just like kind of the power of brand search because i mean i think we all know here that brand search is easy money it's an easy way to so if you can run with big budget where clients you know are paying high dollars cpps uh you know like specifically the body wash industry like when you're competing with dove i mean you're not getting 20 30 dollars cpps it's just not feasible you know the cost per clicks are 10 15 dollars you need 20 25 yeah. clicks to convert one your cp your cost per purchases are in the two to three hundred dollar range um obviously you can start to manipulate those numbers when you start to incorporate brand search and you can sh start showing an overall blended row as of, um, you know, lower, oh, we're at our $55 cost per purchase overall. Well, yeah, 60% of that is through your brand search. Um, so it'd be interesting to see like, when you get to the level that you guys are working at and that what we worked at in the past, what have you guys done for brand incrementality to kind of prove the theory of brand search is definitely not just worthless? Um, mm -hmm. I'll kind of let you answer that and then I'll kind of get into a, kind of some, some of the stuff that we did last time, which was pretty interesting, but I would love to hear 
anything that you guys have around that that piece yeah i give this one to rule you can do this one <laughs> yeah here, here, here's the data again yeah so no i think i think there's a couple of things you, we need to realize and that's you know that's the part of obviously it's easy money um i totally agree with that um um, what I do think, uh, what, one of the things that we do to check if, if there's a brand search happening caused by whatever happening, like you can actually separate the, the audiences on a brand campaign. So you can say, hey, uh, for example, if you're running a YouTube campaign, uh, for, you can actually set up audiences for those that have viewed the video. And if you set up that audience and you connect it to the brand campaign, you can actually see how many people clicked on the brand ad after they've watched the video. Like that is one thing that could say, hey, actually somebody's, you know, your name was still in their head. It's not 100% science waterproof. That's, I think that's also something we have to let go of mm -hmm. um, simply because it's, you know, it's survey based. If it's brand uplift studies like Google, is, you know, they, they provide that for bigger brands. Uh, we haven't been engaging with those. Like uh, we are slightly below that. Um, so what we're doing is, yeah, um, incrementality tests based on location where you have like, I'm going to, push hard on a specific location that is similar, like metropolitan area, and we're just gonna set the benchmark. And then you're doing the same thing for the other, but then you're pushing hard and you look at if there's a significant increase in brand in interest. And so impressions on the exact search term of that brand, for example. Yep. This is still a hell of a lot, a lot of work. I mean, I'm, I'm also like, when I'm thinking about it, it's not my favorite thing to do, um, but it's this, this is if you are, um, going to spend a lot of money on display, YouTube, um, or maybe even Facebook. I mean, you can even connect that eventually to that. Um, yeah, you do need to set it up in that. I, I, I think that's the one thing to set it up in, in uh, if you're not able to do brand survey studies. Yeah. Um, but I'm definitely open uh, for your idea, Justin. That's, uh, yeah. that's for sure. Trying to pull up this, I'm pulling up this email because we had a, we had a, so do you guys, are you guys utilizing search console when you connect to your AdWords accounts? Do you guys set that up? In yeah, we set it up. Yeah. So we were using that for, I know like the one you're talking about where you have to put a hundred K into certain locations and they do all that kind of stuff. Cause some of the, some of the clients that we were doing things with too, um, were also, um, they had like, you know, they're in target and all that stuff. So they, they use store visits. So we had set up store visit campaigns and all that kind of stuff, but we did an interesting thing with, and I'm trying, I went back and going through my emails to find it. Um, cause I, I had never actually, the, this guy was really, really knowledgeable. Um, like this is basically what he focuses on and, this was new to me and I actually learned it. Um, what we did basically was we took, here it is. Let me read this here. We took top five keywords that were shown for organic only. And we measured clicks and impressions. Um, and we looked at click loss, like the percentage of click loss on those top five terms. And then what we did is we took those same terms and we looked at top five keywords when an ad in an organic listing was present. And you can pull that in that search terms report um, if you know what I'm talking about. And then so what we did is we looked at the organic loss versus the ad loss. And what we did is when so for like, for example, this first keyword they had, it's a longer tailed search term brand term, but for organic, they had about 7200 searches with about 281 clicks. So they were at like a 4% CTR. And then for the when an ad was present, they were at um, 7,200 impressions with 1,600 clicks with the 22% CTR. Um, and then we took like their average order value and their average purchase rate and like combined that based on the impression and clicks. And then essentially what the, the numbers that he did was he indicates these five terms, ad clicks range between 60 to, then he, and they ran like a formula and I can try and find it and send it to you guys. But then they were actually able to come back Essentially, what they did was they came back with an incremental max CPC on for brand. If you're paying over X CPC, okay. anything else is not not incremental. Um, yeah, I'm so curious so if if you have something, just send it through. We'll wanna see. If we yeah, can I'll I'll try and see if I can get the calculations from the lady that we yeah. worked with. Yeah, uh, so, so so just sorry to to just check in. Like you're talking about the organic versus paid brand. Like if you if it's worth running a branded campaign, right? 
yeah like at what point i mean you could put yeah. obviously you you know some brands want 100 so, so for example there's one brand that that i have access to their stuff and i've in, you know dealt with and they work with but part of through another agency that we kind of partner with and stuff and they spend like over a million dollars a month on brand search i mean huge oh, damn. Damn. huge and it's just like when you're spending that i mean they spend more on branded search than they do non-brand search and it's ridiculous it is and they're so like worried and i'm just i just sit there and i think my, and obviously you can't tell these people because they're they're fortune 100 but it's just like yeah such a waste of money uh, you, you know how I, much I recall i recall there was some sort of uh okay you mute oh uh, sorry yeah there was the uh, i think ebay was one of the first ones a few years ago that did a test and said we're no longer gonna advertise on our own domain uh, on brand for ebay because it was really not doing much for them but i can it really depends i think like if you if you're spending more on brand than on non-brand i don't know you really want to find out if it is actually because this is that that hurts that hurts that hurts a yeah. lot uh, yeah i mean it's there i just started doing some data pools and stuff for them and like having to do some pacing and all that and like just even their spreadsheet that they use for daily pacing and like it's like 60 tabs long with 45 pivot tables. I mean, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. It's just, it's insane. It's insane. Yeah. Like if I, if I can add something to that, actually, I've got a, I got a nice story, like insider story on, on a, a, a huge brand. Like it's, it's actually international and I'm not allowed to talk about it in that sense. So it's really exclusive. Um, it's more about the don't um, don't don't oh yeah i'm sorry i'm sorry well i guess I mean, you hear vincent just pulled me back on this one um no it's it's actually what you're saying like i i totally get i totally get the idea of like it's it's a waste of money or it's a waste of like where would you and and so you do have to do your research on like are we losing let's say just dove soap or whatever you know let's let's call a big brand or is it actually okay just to not run it and just hope that your organic is picking those things up and I guess, I guess Dove is okay because there's a lot of sellers, resellers that are going to, you know, are going to pull in there and just, you know, just selling stuff through Google ads in that sense. But there's also a situation where it's highly competitive. Uh, and then if you're actually losing your brand position because Google is putting paid search in favor of your, you know, organic results, especially on e com uh if if they can like i'm just uh i'm not sure do you guys have the live rue in in the states yeah right the live rue or something like uber eats kind of thing like uber eats or I, Grubhub. i don't have any of that stuff i mean we, i think we have uh, I, I, uh, something like that yeah. well there's a huge like there's huge venture capitalist based or backed like uh, economy right where it doesn't really matter <laughs> that it's not profitable or that it's costing so much you just don't want to lose market share and that's where they where the kpis come from like we don't want to lose traffic on our brand because it's a it's a sign that we're losing market share and that's you know if you want to protect your brand at all costs it's probably because the alternative is worse and i guess because google is so liberal in that sense to show anyone who's who's just booking your brand as a keyword Right. You know, yeah, sure. Quality scores. Yeah, sure. But they actually take your customers away if they're really the same kind of deal. Yeah. So that's uh, that's the devil's advocate, you know, in, in me that says, well, yeah, still, is it worth it losing it? So I guess those studies that you're that you're mentioning are definitely helpful. And eBay, you know, eBay is just it's it's the equivalent yeah. of of everything you buy on the Internet. Right. So it's like Coca-Cola, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My always solution is, and that kind of leads into my next question, but one thing on this before we get to the next one is part of that whole thing was, you know, their mentality for another one that spends quite a bit is, you know, they're in like Target and they're in Walmart and they're in all those stores. Well, they actually run ads themselves and they run Google shopping and sell the same product. So their thought is, why would I want to pay for it when the retailers are spending the money and they're going to sell our product anyway? Um, my question was always, you know, and I always push customer data. Um, you know, especially from an algorithm AI training perspective, when you start losing all of that data that you're flowing through these accounts, you start learning, losing machine, machine learning, which ties over to your non-brand campaigns, which can become a whole thing. But that was always part of my argument. 
But then the next thing I always argued with, you know, I try to tell them, but a lot of them don't listen. The smaller brands do that are more budget constrained is, and I'm sure you guys will tell me the same thing. In the 12 years you've been doing this, how many competitor campaigns have you seen run <laughs> profitable? Um, 10% maybe less. Eight. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I haven't seen any except one this last week. I finally seen <laughs> first your first one after 13 yeah. years. It, you rarely, I mean, you rarely, rarely see it. I mean, just yeah. the search intent of those people searching for those brands are so high. I mean, just think of it yourself. When you search for the name of a brand of a product, your intent's so high. I don't think any of us can probably say, oh yeah, I remember I clicked on this ad and bought a different product. I mean, you know what you want, you're searching for it. Um, it, it I think it's more of like a status versus ego thing that for uh, today we, we searched, uh, we checked out some, some uh, PPC tools just to see like, how can we make things smarter? And we saw that the one that we're looking for only had an organic listing, but all the competitors, like three or four were on top of it. And like, I'm still not clicking on those, but they have messages like, uh, like the angle copies, like, uh, you know, want real uh, powerful tools like this, then use us. So yeah. it, I'm, I don't think it's actually working because like, if you look at the statistics from 12 years, barely any were profitable, but still they do it. So we know quality score is pretty poor in those terms always. Oh, for sure. So, you know, you pay, you pay pole position prices for, for something that might not even result in anything. So yeah, it's an interesting, but really had something to add, I believe, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I just think uh, again, like that was advocate part again, <laughs> I like to do that uh, is, is uh, especially with those uh, software solutions. I mean, it's, it's the alternative is around the corner and um, it depends a little bit on, on it. it, it, it yeah. The answer is it depends. And I think when you're talking about a travel to, uh, you know, a travel agency or whatever, uh, you like booking.com or whatever price line, do you actually do feel like you want to maybe check for different destinations in that part? Yeah. And um, um, with e-com, it depends on the kind of products that you're selling that if you're, you know, if you're showing up like, and then this, yeah, this competitor does a very, very well job by, uh, by, by, by adding a great benefit in the ad copy that I haven't thought of. I'm actually interested. I'm actually clicking on those ads. If Vincent says he's not clicking, I'm actually that kind of person who's triggered by it. Like, oh, well, okay, that's a daring, that's a daring uh, story. Let me, let me check. And then maybe I find out it's not what I'm looking for, but kind of, it really depends a little bit. And I do want to add to that. And that's maybe also a nice topic maybe for you, Justin, is um, that if you're adding this competitor campaign, um, are we really focusing on smart bidding? Yes or no? Because if I'm adding the competitors in broad and I'm just saying, hey, please put this in max conversions or smart target ROAS, target CPA, and I'm giving it a little bit of space, I found the results a lot better than me pushing that brand because I want to be strategically placed in a high position amongst the others because i think you're totally right like i think 95 percent of those people who are searching for the brand don't really want but those five percent could still be worth running a smart campaign on the side not the highest budgets not the highest targets but just you know you know you know, you know what i mean does that yeah. make sense yeah, no, it doesn't. I should probably clarify it. It doesn't work for us on the e-com side, but when we've done like what you were saying, like local lead gen or for like plumbing or stuff like that, that's more like they're shopping for price and not necessarily it's a service based. Then we've seen it work a little more, but like straight e-com, you know, nine times out of 99 out of a hundred, it's very hard to get to work unless, unless they have dedicated budget that gotcha. want to, push to that to have awareness. But yeah. And your, your example of, you know, booking and stuff like that is a very good example um, of that. So you mentioned one really good thing, quality scores. Um, so, I mean, you guys are familiar with SCAGs. You guys are familiar with yep. people building tight ad groups with tight buckets. Let's talk your guys' – let's talk the way that you guys set up your campaign structure um, from a non-branded perspective. Are you guys doing, let's talk two things, campaign level breakout, ad group level breakout down. And I'm kind of more curious about 
you know, like your keywords, how you're structuring those. Um, for example, we don't use, rarely use broad keywords unless it's big, big budgets. We always usually start with phrase and exact. So kind of talk to us a little bit about how your strategy looks and how you guys break that out. Yeah. So mostly we, we start off um, our campaigns. Like nowadays things change, right? Because uh, when smart bidding is now at a point where you can't ignore it anymore, a lot of people are still, you, you, you can't go around anymore. You know, it's, it's working. So you have to think about, okay, I have to set my strategy on, on campaign level. Yes, you can do some things on ad group level, but also your budget allocation is on, on campaign level. So what we try to do most is see, okay, where's, where's the, the search volume most? So mostly we split them out by step of the funnel, top of funnel keywords, middle of funnel keywords, bottom of funnel keywords. Uh, our legacy approach was that we start off with BMM, uh, uh, modified broad match. However, as we know, that got killed off because Google basically wants more control uh, or give us less control. So now it's more uh, phrase, but we do have some accounts where we're testing uh, with an all out uh, or not all out, but more of like a broad approach, broad keywords. Um, we have seen we have seen cases of like where, because for smart bidding, two things are important. You need like high quality data and you need volume. If those things are like good, then smart bidding has like free role to really find out real quick what to do. Uh, so we have seen cases where an all out approach on broad was actually doing better than the refiner structures but it all comes down like if you're sending the right information to the machine you know what you're doing and you're aligning this to the business uh, business objective um this is where the value lies so we are not right now we're, we're mostly sp splitting up our ad groups per like phrase and different matches but the exact match i'm only uh, throwing that in after i see that the exact matches are actually coming through so we mostly start off the ad groups with with phrase for for search approaches so you busted out let's just use a body let's use a body wash brand for example and we'll say keywords around best body wash keywords around men's body wash would you bust that out and keep you know seven to eight 10, 12 phrase match keywords in one ad group around best phrases and then have your ads all talk about it being best um, and then have men's body wash with, you know, seven to eight keywords based in an ad group like that. Is that kind of how you're structuring it? So, so that to me is more of like in line with the old school Skag approach, which is really, really nitty gritty. Uh, we've seen that Google now knows pretty much like the semantics, you know, if, you, if you're using uh, shoes, it can also mean sneakers and um, all these kind like if you have an, uh, a Fitbit, Fitbit watch, like smartwatch, it, all the kind of synonyms, it understands what you mean. So it's not necessarily for us to split all these synonym keywords up into other, other uh, ad groups. So we're, because back in 2015, 2016, we're still using the Skag approach, but since then it, it has evolved into a more of like, um, a little bit more liberal approach if you want. Um, and on top of that, what we're doing as well is, is just look at what, what is Google Shopping doing and in search terms regard and reverse engineer those back to search campaigns. So that helps too. Plus um, dynamic search ads is really helpful in, in regards to crawling and looking for gaps in your keyword structure that you haven't got yet. Yep. You guys with your DSAs, are you making your own business feed or are you just indexing it from what's indexed in Google? Uh, both. Um, we, we literally have both, but preferably we're using the page feed if, uh, oh. because you get more accurate data. And then you probably like the way that I've always done is I tag, you know, like we have men's body wash, women's body wash, I'll actually tag them. So on the DSA level, I can break it out by label or whatever. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. 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 That's the way it can kind of like the, the custom label approach for DSA. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do, do, do. That makes sense. Um, you, you got some nice Google shopping questions there. Yeah, I was actually oh, yeah. Um, feed. So I think I think just maybe one more thing, Justin. Yeah. I think that's just just because I think it's interesting. Um, by the way, I love you too, Connor Martin. Oh man, there's there's fan fan mail in the in the comment section. I'm sorry for that. Um, uh, the uh, the part is uh, where where you're talking about structures. It's actually also interesting to to you know get a grip on. I think you you like you said you like broad. It's it used to be like the antagonist. Right? You, you're not supposed to use broad broad is cool like it's synonym for shit traffic part of my language um it's really bad uh it's it's, it's a money waster etc uh, etc et and um i do think 
they're doing better and better. It's again, that was that's a good part, but I do think they're getting better and better. And the part of it is that what, what Google claims to do now is that they're looking at not only like broad is, is taking more signals into account when you're using smart bidding. So um, where you do exact and phrase, and I'm not sure if I can pull the exact uh, scheme, uh, the graph together, but it's basically exact looks at, uh, and phrase looks at the ad copy, it looks at the, uh, the, the ad copy itself, it looks at the, um, um, the targeting obviously in self and similar, similar searches, but broad is actually also looking at the other keywords in the ad group. So if you're filling your ad group with relevant, like around that topic, it looks at that part as well. And it looks at the landing page, which is also very interesting. And it means, and, the, and to me, it, it makes total sense that content and unique, your own relevant content is actually playing a huge role in, in that process of, of getting the right people on your site. Because obviously Google does, is, you know, it's become big because of their organic um, the way they understand what is on your site and what you're trying to sell, what you're trying to tell, um, you kind of have to represent have to, to represent that in your keyword strategy and your ad copy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess you know that's that's where I think at a certain point we do not get to really choose the exact keywords anymore. Like it's gonna gradually move away from us Google Ads managers and move towards the direction of, well, automation, AI, machine learning, that kind of stuff. We, it's an we, interesting topic. Yeah, we mix broad and more like with a new account, you know, that we're starting or we're doing a full rebuild. We always start tight and then we slowly loosen as it, as it goes. Um, but if you're running broad match and you're running 5K a day or 10K a day budget, you better be in their negative search terming every single day, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. every single yeah. day. Um, has to, otherwise you just blow through money. And I think a lot of people don't do it enough, um, but yeah. So um, on the shopping piece, let's talk smart shop. Well, there was a question in here. Um, have you ever segmented campaigns by device on top of your other breakout conditions and then applied smart bidding? Um, no, we don't. Honestly. Yeah, I, I do on the shopping side. So all of our shopping, especially for manual shopping, we break it well because if you think about it, for manual shopping, um, from an ad group perspective, we bust it out to start by device type because your bid adjustment doesn't necessarily take into specific device and product ID as much. Like you don't get as much control. So we always bust out in our manual. We have a mobile tablet and then we have a desktop and then we do our breakouts on the product group levels of by item id and all that stuff so we have more yeah. um i don't know that do you guys do that i don't think i've seen one account i've ever audited do that um, no we, we we don't split them out by device also because um we you have to make decisions at some point because you can you, you can split it up into certain ways if you're using custom labels and you have a, a certain structure in your head that you want to convey if you then also would split them up by device you're going to end up with like hundreds of of, of these campaigns which you don't want and especially in, in in regards to smart bidding you can have multiple campaigns but you don't want to stretch them out too much because then you're going to run into the system isn't working really with you so you have to make some concessions here and there as to when do you want to split them out that way and um by device we we don't do honestly interesting yeah i do i do think also when you're doing smart like when you're doing smart bidding on top of that uh target row as is at a certain point is basically just you know ignoring that anyways uh obviously target cpa does have uh, uh that functionality where you can still plus some like but in general it it, it moves budgets into the direction it, it's 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 more successful uh, I think it's really like it's really important that you do look at those differences. If there's like a significant difference in in how how Google is is um, uh, what's it called uh, delivering the ads impressions, like if there's actually a huge difference in in, in how it performs on, on on desktop versus mobile, it might be making sense to work the other way. So to kind of like, okay, well, we do see this in our analysis and that desktop is significantly just very poor and it squeezes the budget because of that, then you might want to test that separately in a desktop campaign and say, hey, I'm going to 
deep dive into this matter and kind of try and find out why this is the case. And then you can actually work that other way around. I think that's kind of what, what, what fits the 80-20 approach that we're trying to work with. Like we try to kind of do, let Google do the research for us before we go all out or go basically, you know, it depends obviously on the brand, but where you have to put a lot of effort in it to get the structure that you like versus first build and first look. And then maybe, you know, you can, you can, you can segment, you can, you know, eventually make smaller groups, isolate things and, uh, and, and then work that way. Uh, there's something to say for that, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We usually see, obviously most, I would say nine times out of 10 desktops always converting better than mobile. Um, you know, you know why? <laughs> well, I want to pause. <laughs> no, no, it's I, what I thought was really interesting. And this is a nine figure brand that we talked about. It's like they're, they're only optimizing on desktop. They're optimizing their CRO on desktop. Ask them, ask a fee, fee WO guy how often he's actually looking at the, his own phone before he runs another A-B test. And I know, I know it's all responsive. It's all great. But look at the loading times Shopify has on mobile. Responsive sucks. It's so bad. It's mm -hmm. so bad. It's, it's all, every time you put a page, and then, then they get this great, great squeeze pages that are looking amazing. But Google just hates them because they load so slowly that it, they, they punish you for it. And then obviously you're getting different traffic and also people still just don't like it, that it's so slow or it's not. But it's, that it's hilarious because it's 80% of your traffic often, like mobile. It's like the majority, but it's not on par as wherever it could be. But I guess um, the old responsive designs, they're, they're, they're not optimal, basically. That's where the, uh, the nuance is. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, that, that's <laughs> obviously I was, I'm hearing myself again. Sorry, Shane. No, I, but, but I think a little bit of nuance, obviously, is that in general, people are on the go when they're on the mobile, you know, yeah. when we, we know that there's, there's a different mindset that you want, but that, that's actually the reason why you have to be so fast and why you have to have a separate mobile strategy, basically. Like if you have, just imagine you're on the go, you're in the train or you're, I don't know, like you, you just have your phone in your hand, you have that instant gratification. And I'm not sure if you've been trying to browse through all those different tabs on your mobile phone versus how many Chrome tabs you've been opening on your desktop. Like I have this like widescreen monitor and I've got like 50 tabs open. I'm sure you have more, Justin. No. Um, and the pen, no, oh, <laughs> it's just, I'm just, I'm just assuming things. <laughs> no, but I mean, if you just like how easy it is to click through desktop versus how important it is to stick around. Like I'm just putting my phone away immediately versus mm -hmm. I have this huge thing in front of me telling me that this is a great product. So it has to be super focused. And yeah, I mean, it's underestimated. It's, it's, it's almost scary when I talk about my, talk to my clients that I don't know that's actually 80%, like you're saying, like it's more than 80% sometimes with that people come from mobile and they don't, they've never looked at their site or they like seldomly looked at their site like that. Yeah. So it's uh, definitely like an opportunity for those that to, uh, um, especially for those that are not running on Shopify because, you know, obviously you're kind of bound to designs uh, on that sense, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting that with all the new stuff that just rolled out with like the Dawn 2.0 and stuff, we're starting to test the new theme and, and see how yeah. that works. But I, I think Shopify knows that they have to step their game up. Um, mm -hmm. I think they're doing so, but I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, their shopping checkout is great. I mean, that's that's for sure. I mean, shop pay and everything. That's 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 totally. I mean, I don't think that's the problem. I think it's really what happens before that. It's the framework, uh, it's the way that the app is yeah. built, and there's all the callouts, and you know, it's yeah. just. I'm not a developer, um, but it's just a very poor framework, especially for people that don't know what they're doing. Like you delete an app, but necessarily all the code doesn't delete for some of these apps. Then you still have all these call outs and, the, and the, you know, they need to make it seamless for people, um, you know, especially for the brands that don't have developers. But even some of the developers I've noticed, you know, they're not using Git and they're not pushing things correctly to keep track of everything. Plus you got people editing stuff here. That's all right. I mean, it's just, it's great. But... And you got shop owners uh, hiring one person and then hop to the next one because he didn't do immediately what he asked. And then right. the one has to work, has to work with the legacy code. 
yeah, there's plenty of reasons why those things screw up eventually. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where it's, you know, what else? Out, it's so easy for even us to go in and do things, but like when you go to like a platform like WordPress, some developers like WordPress and they don't, and it's like at what point is it worth a brand to get off shop? I mean, you got brands that do, like you know. Look at Kylie Jenner's brand. She probably does over a hundred million a year. I, I heard Magento is a curse word in your world, man. Right? Oh, that's tough. Magento is a nightmare. <laughs> Terrible. It's powerful, but if you can find a developer that can do it, that's it. The problem is finding a developer that will do Magento is, and I had here's a story. Like my my best friend, he's got a warehouse over here. He was on a custom, full custom. And it was just outdated and stuff. I think back in like 2016, he had a buddy that um, was into Magento, but wasn't Magento, but was smart, uh, moved him over to Magento and had nothing but issues. I mean, revenue just went <laughs> scramble. Like I helped him, dude. I interviewed like six Magento people. They all wanted like $5,000 to do an audit to try and find the issue. The audit would take them three weeks. Then you'd wait three weeks and they would, they're like, I'm too busy. I have other clients paying me. And I was like six developers and they charge $250 an hour, which is like astronomical. Like the chances of finding a reliable Magento developer, um, if brands can find them, hang on to them because they're, I don't, do you guys have Magento experience? Uh, well, we, we had one client, which was Magento. Yeah, yeah, we had one. It wasn't Hong Kong. Yeah, we, we had one. And, uh, but I do know a lot of people who are actually using Magento in the e-commerce yeah. space. And uh, it's, 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 it's actually interesting to, uh, to hear that because what, what I heard from the guy that uh, was almost like a, I don't know, what's it called? A pre preacher, like somebody who's uh, in favor of, uh, of a certain, uh, obviously that's biased. But what he told me when I actually told your story, like I think I've read your story, something like that or something like that. And then there's obviously horrible stories about that because it's, but that's not really Magento. It's the developer part, exactly. And uh, I do think uh, a lot of uh, corporates actually choose for Magento because they can invest in solid, like in a total, like a complete team or a professional gold partner, for example, and really, you know, craft something custom that they, that they need compared to like doing something that is not scalable as in, you know, custom builds and have to deal with legacy code all the time, which is the downside of having that. Yeah. And Shopify, I mean, you know, we know the Shopify story from, what was it again, that, that famous brand that moved to Shopify be from, from Magento? I'm not sure about that, but it's uh, um, sure. it something that, but uh, I mean. The problem is there's just the developers are so like, high, highly sought after and they're so tremendously expensive. Not only that, Magento hands down is better than Shopify. It's 10, but your development cost is like times 50. I mean, it's just brands need to be able to afford it. But if you can get somebody that's good at Magento, which they're hard to find, um, it's not luck. It's not like looking for a media buyer. I mean, it's like looking for, you know, Osama. Needle bin, in a haystack. Yeah, it's like Osama bin Laden and the freaking the, the mountains over there. I mean, they're hard to find, but if you can find them, like, that, that platform is so powerful, even from like an SEO perspective. Like we went from zero with this brand on like huge search terms, um, like 90, I mean, 90 days, it was astronomical, the power of how well that platform can be done if you can find somebody that can do it. Um, and there's brands out there that have it, but also like for us, and I'm sure for you, even from like a feed perspective, if you worked on that, like it becomes a little bit cumbersome because you can't just go in and install feed for Google shopping and have the feed up and running. And, you know, it's, it's everything just gets drawn out. And it's, yeah. Out, yeah. So it, it does affect workflow too, but server costs go up. I mean, you're not paying 2000 a month for plus you're paying, you know, the, I think the developer, li like if you go to the Magento enterprise license alone is like 40 or 50 grand. Plus you have your server costs, which for the one brand we were doing was like five, 10 K a month. Um, crazy. Yeah. And then you're responsible for PII for personal. I mean, you have to follow all those laws to store your information and, but yeah, that's a whole hour discussion on that right there. Yeah. <laughs> so let's, let's stick to Google. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so shopping. Let's just, I mean, we have a few minutes here, but let's talk about, let's go over like the top three to five things when you guys are auditing accounts 
that are just major misses on like an optimization basis. One thing that comes to mind for myself, and it's you would think it's a given, but location location breakdown and bid adjustments on campaigns. Add all 50 states, one individually, then rather just adding the US, you got more granular control. Tell me a little bit about things that you see like that, that it's just like, wow, I just, you know, I, I never see this. I'm the only guy that does this. Nobody does this. What, what, are, the, what are those tactics? <laughs> so to my spread, like that one, I love the one we're doing that too, like spread out all the states. Um, but more often than not, I find that it always starts with the fundamentals. It starts with the tracking, the tracking, the conversion pixel there, either still on last click, and we're talking here, uh, a business that's, that's putting like uh, five figures in, in Google Ads it's, it's per day. It's, it's insane. So the pixel first, then uh, the attribution model, then the click-through window. So if we're talking smart bidding and machine learning, this is where it all starts, right? And if you don't have that right, then that, that's the first step. Um, secondly, uh, more often than not, uh, they're, they either have everything on smart shopping everything they have like one campaign one ad group and then 500 products all run through smart shopping which you know you get results but how are you going to scale you can't so um like we're we're believer in smart but not like everything and you want to it needs to tie into the business objective um so that's the second one um question on the first one and just a point yeah. don't use don't be lazy and use an import goal from google analytics also yes don't i be. see that uh, like transaction imports, um, even duplicate tracking sometimes oh. that you're like, you're spending so much money, you're running duplicate tracking, what, what's it going on? Yeah, it's, yeah it's, I, I mean, I can't, yeah, on that too is usually what we've seen and I just audited two accounts last week and I have to go back to them and I have to say, sorry guys, your expected ROAS of what you had is half of that because you had an analytics goal importing and then you had a purchase event. Oh. Filing. So sorry, yep. you're, you're 6X spending 20K, <laughs> it's actually 3X. You're, yeah. You're giving him this tough love, you know, they, 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 you do the audits, you pay for it, and then you give them this news. So, yeah, but it's the truth. Imagine how long they have been running with that setup, how much money it's costing them. They are expecting, you know, we have this amount of sales. Must be a discrepancy between Facebook and Google. No, you're running twice the amount of conversion and revenue. Yep. It's, yeah. Yeah. And then the second one, or well, even another thing on tracking, which I've noticed uh, is a lot of, and we don't run this. I know a lot of people do, but most people are using that Google shopping app, app and injecting all of the add to cart view product. I shut all of those off um, mm -hmm. only from the simple fact of, because when you're getting into display campaigns and you're, you're getting into YouTube campaigns, when you have to start using segment and breaking all of those out to look at all conversion value for view through conversion, because keep in yeah. mind, uh, and I don't, you guys, probably, I'm sure you guys know this, but most people don't, is your conversion value is that drastically different than your all conversion value. It doesn't include your view through conversion. So mm -hmm. if you're wanting to attribute the difference in incrementality from a click through basis on a view through basis on those display in YouTube, you're going to have to click segment and then you get all of these breakdowns, you know, seven yeah. or eight, and it just it makes the optimization process a lot longer. So I personally always shut those off. Do you guys utilize those to optimize towards upper funnel events or not? Um, honestly, no, we, we, we have nine out of the t eight out of the 10 that we, that do have a Shopify store. We see that the pixels are based on these apps. So we yeah. do see that <clears throat> we, um, we're using them, but I, I like to, to add them as micro converge just to see like, okay, how how is this campaign attributing to, to earlier steps in the funnel? Uh, but I'm not really switching them off or anything like that. Mm, okay. I just do it because it's just, it's cleaner and easier for me to optimize. Yeah. Mm. That's probably an old school thing. Um, number two, what was the number two thing you said? Smart shopping? Yeah. Uh, through saying Everybody's again. running a smart shopping, yeah. like all the products in there and just go yep yep i i really agree with that one um do you guys have any way of measuring obviously and i haven't really tested this but in now the settings and smart shopping there's the target new customers and past existing customers or target new customers yeah. do you guys break that out and i actually honestly i don't even know the answer to this um if you're running the same let's say you're running one smart shopping campaign and the one is targeting new and the other one is targeting new one online. It, that should technically in theory be able to serve there. I guess there would be some crossover, but have you guys tested that and kind of seen 
because obviously for people that don't know with smart shopping it's a black box right yeah. you can't come in and say oh this is all new business driven 60 percent conversion is all new driven from yeah. smart shopping so how are you guys tackling that piece of that black box so yeah so i think we uh, we recently discovered something and uh Rodel's gonna tell you what it was <laughs> Oh man, that's such a nice that's entry. So I think. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> All right. So, uh, no, and, and, and it's not necessarily recent, but um, what people tend to forget when you're setting that up for customers, new customers, you're actually adding hypothetical revenue to your revenue column. So when you're saying, like I'm saying, and, 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 and I'm just looking at, like, if you're blinking now, Justin, if you're actually like, oh my God, is this the case? No, no, it's uh, it's it's it happens that some people just fill in like, okay, the CLV is 180, while my original initial sale is 40, for example. It just basically whenever a new sale is generated, it adds 140 to your revenue, making it bloated. So, um, yeah, yeah, you have to check that out, Justin. <laughs> you need some venture capitalists for this. Do you yeah. see the value for that is so when you walk me through this. Because I haven't used just targeting the new. Oh, perfect. Yeah, perfect. So when you check the box new, are you putting a static value in there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? It's based on your own, based on your own, like you have basically, you, like they're, they're giving you the option to say, hey, how much do you want to assign? How much revenue do you want to assign for new customers? Which is obviously for venture capitalist backed businesses, it's really good because then, you know, the higher your revenue is the more google will then push to it because the ROAS is higher for such a sale and that's the, the for some businesses i think though that have like their aov or smaller stores where year over year their aov has been consistent and they're not testing if you have a lot of data and you go into analytics and you pull a year and then you pull it by month by month and your aov is within a couple bucks i would say that's probably not a huge thing tell me if i'm wrong but just thinking out loud if um unless you're doing like huge aov testing why if you if you know your numbers and it's not inflated why would or if you know your numbers and you're confident on those numbers why would it be inflated well it's inflated because if you're reporting in google ads and you're and you as a manager look at oh this looks great actually like 90 percent of my budget goes to this campaign and it's not the actual money that you're getting like, yeah, of course, over maybe three or nine months time, you do collect that data because you did your CLV research. But if you're not having that liquidity in terms of cash flow, mm -hmm. um, it could actually hurt your business pretty hard because, you know, you're not having the cash to catch up with those numbers. And that's more the, that's the concern that, you know, businesses could get if they're just blindly putting in that number. It's like, okay. Just know that you have to keep an eye on your own metrics. Of course, it's it's fundamentals, but it's it's something that people didn't realize up till like, oh, it's actually, oh yeah. wait, what? It's two hundred. Oh, it's not two hundred. It's actually fifty. Just like you're saying with the with the duplicate tracking convert, like duplicate yeah. tracking. It's like it's not the real ROAS at this point. It looks like it's it is because it's taking the CLV into account. Right. I've never so that's the yeah. going in to click it once because I've never I've never ran it yeah. because I it's also pretty pretty new I guess like not that um it's, yeah, it's a couple of months recently, old some year yeah. old maybe yeah. let's see let's see shopping yeah interesting yeah I've never have you got and you guys you guys don't use it either I take it uh, yeah, yeah we, we did we did it's, it's just that we didn't assign the real CLV we just assigned like five bucks on top of it or like not that like that doesn't have like such an impact but at least it it gives like it gives us the insights like hey it's actually trying to target new sales you know that kind of reporting is actually interesting yeah um, I see what you're talking about why yeah, the value yeah. additional value to assign it obviously pre-fills it pre-filled it based on you know probably the data in the ad account but uh, yeah interesting yeah so that's 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 exactly so that's that's the let's say the risk slash danger of that's that kind of weird though why why i wonder why they just wouldn't use your pixel and default the revenue that passes through the string like, yeah i i guess it's not that hun like then that waterproof in that sense um sorry yeah i'm uh, still uh 
echoing. Oh. So the no, it's, it's it's just not that waterproof in terms of cookies. In terms of like, it, it, they still have that issue. And if you just put in like, and yeah, it's, I guess it's also just not in uh, what's it called in Google's interest to to really look at that, right? Interesting. Very interesting. Hmm. Um. So yeah, that was number two. Number three. Uh, what is it? Uh, tracking, smart shopping, um, locations. I often find that um, custom labels, using custom labels in your feed, if you have multiple products, like this is uh, the way to maximize your ROI from shopping. Uh, majority that we see just have the simple of like one campaign, even if it's standard, just one campaign, one ad group and, and still run there, all their products, so you don't want to target row us. Um, yeah, you're just... And, and they, the, the main question I get asked, like, how do I scale my shopping campaigns? And the answer is always before you launch them and it's in your tracking and then in your product feed. Once you've set this up correctly, you can create this refined structure where you can control the outcome of different segments of your product categories. And that's actually where the money lies. And once you have that, then you can scale. So you have to think really far ahead. Like, what is my business objective? Do I want to steer to a ROAS, CPA, growth? And then you go into your feed. How do I, for which categories will I make custom labels? Yeah. Uh, and then you can make this beautiful structure, which helps you with your objective. But nine out of 10 are not using it. One, one thing that I just started doing and I never had done it before because I never had to pull such detailed and long freaking reports for brands until you start spending for those big, big brands and you have to spend mm -hmm. a day pulling data and then do insights or whatever is let's use like a, let's use a body wash big body wash company that's global or whatever they're going to have their men's and women's line then they're going to have also by like foaming this is an example foaming body wash uh like sc scrub bait. smell yeah and then by scent so what what i and i don't know why but if you go into the reports you can actually pull reports by custom label across all your shopping campaigns. So you can actually, I mean, obviously you can't do that from within. If you have several shopping campaigns, trying to combine product revenue or category revenues and all that stuff is you can just pull by your dimension, custom label equals, and then it'll pull across all your campaigns, uh, row as by the scent type. You know, if they have 30 cents, you can then go back and say, hey, this is our best scent because you're having it broken out in your feed. Um, that was something actually I just started doing, I think about a month ago, but it was, pretty powerful for the brands because they had never seen that before. And I was just like, wow, I didn't even, I don't use that reporting feature very much. Um, yeah. I don't know what you guys do, but I used to never be in there until the last probably year until those high level. Reports. Yeah. Cool. And, and one of the uh, important parts, like we have experienced with clients, sometimes clients, um, they had a payment error or Shopify's goes down. And there's now this functionality as data exclusions in the uh, the bid strategies, advanced controls. You had seasonality adjustments, and they also since you know half a year they have that one. This one is is kind of like the biggest enemy is instability for machine learning and AI stuff. So when you are offline for a few hours or a day, always put it in there because this is um, it will help you not you ruin about? your statistics. Sorry, what were you talking about? So if you go into tools and settings, then yep. uh, bit strategies, yep. and then at the left side, you have advanced controls, and then you have a seasonality adjustment and data exclusion. Now, up until last year, there was only seasonality adjustment. We've been butchering it for whenever a store was offline or uh, uh, the credit card was, was expired or whatever, and they didn't have a backup or whatever, we covered that with like a decrease on conversion rate so that the machine learning knew, okay, I shouldn't take these days into account as they normally would. Um, um, so you go back and add it. Like if you, yeah. if you had an outage for two days, you'd go back and add the data. Exclusion. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Because otherwise it takes those two days into account and, and sees like, Hey, what, what was going on here? Uh, your conversion rate was dropping to whatever, or you had some clicks. You don't want that. Got it. Yeah. I didn't, I have never actually, I honestly haven't, and we run seasonal, but we always are just adjusting manually, I guess, mm -hmm. not really used, um, this tremendously but i'll have to I, we, we've been using this because the um the algorithm looks at the last 21 days but it ignores the last seven days so this time window is consistently shifting so whenever in those last seven days it continues to those days that were online or where you had like a butchering of your you did get clicks but you didn't get conversions uh, we want to tell the system like do not take this into account uh, because it start your averages start to uh falter and, and change yeah. Yeah. so this is one of the greatest things that we 
got from Google uh, last year, pretty yeah, much. Cool. Hmm. Interesting. And just to, just to add to that, just in the um, the custom label part, actually, that was uh, that was a good point. I think uh, I think that just like what I also like to do is the price range section, where you can really just look at, hey, um, actually, I have a little upsell, like a bundle that is one ninety, like let's say ninety nine dollars, and the other normal product is seventy nine, and you're hesitant to really push the bundle because it looks like. You know, it's making the product more expensive uh, in the results. But if you add those price labeling, you know, you can actually report on price. If you add them as a custom label, then uh, you can test like specifically or label those specifically. I mean, you can do gift wrapped versus not gift wrapped. You can do uh, obviously sizes of the product, like the body wash. Is are you are you going to sell them for like uh, I don't know uh, uh, the metrics, but uh, like five hundred milliliters or a liter? Um, versus that kind of stuff is, is pretty interesting to to exactly the insights and then then that's one thing uh, because what you're mentioning is it's it's so at, at a certain level insights are actually more valuable than the sales itself like the sales are you know that's that's a, that's a maturity level like you know the highest probably that is necessary because at a certain point that's not what they care about the 10 10 extra sales that it's generating it's just saying hey wow there's much more demand for this particular product online. So we might want to put emphasis on it or we want to build, I don't know, campaigns around it. Like it's actually better. Yeah. So that, that is definitely, I totally agree. This, this, this is a super interesting insight. And if you want to, if you need to move budgets, then that's definitely one of those, you know, one of those levers that you can pull. Like, okay, there's, there's an area that we have been simply underestimating maybe because of our own bias. Yeah. or experience that makes sense um measurement for most of your brands are you guys using and raw we'll probably should do a call in the next couple of weeks if you want just specifically yeah. google analytics um i think we both have a lot of wealth and knowledge on that and can probably go into some stuff what and yeah. i've never done one on on just analytics specifically i think it would be really 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 good what are you guys using using to measure attribution do you guys use a third-party platform uh, like wicked or how, like what is your go-to for most brands on how you're doing your data crunching and yeah you were you were you were you were mentioning both of them <laughs> almost now um, i mean we've been uh, we've been uh, looking at the high rows as well and wicked as well uh, some clients simply do that uh, they 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 are testing themselves they are um you know there's there's a client saying hey uh, we just really rely on uh, customer and survey data so you know where it's like more about last click actually like last feeling, like it's more of a gut feeling thing, which is super interesting. Uh, it's terrible to work with because you can't really pinpoint anything, uh, but high rows and, 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 and we could definitely as well do similar things in that sense where we just look at it and we, we test different attribution models. We see, hey, there's actually, this is interesting. And I mean, one specific uh, example was that we were running a very top of funnel keyword and it shows terrible results in, in, in last click in Google in direct, and also in, in position data driven, it was, you would just put it offline. You would just not use it. And then at a certain point, we decided to run that top of funnel keyword to a much more of a lead generation funnel. And that lead generation funnel was longer than a day or two or three. It takes a week. Uh, and the chances that you're losing that cookie still, I mean, it's still reliant on cookies a lot, uh, even though the new uh, enhanced conversions are, are probably going to catch up a little bit, but then you still have the, you know, there's a gap. And that that is actually where, where a, a third party tool that is, you know, doing fingerprinting basically um, is, is coming in. And I think that was super interesting. Like it turned out that this top of funnel keyword, when, you know, when the funnel is right, I mean, it will be led to a quiz and the quiz turned into a email funnel and uh, the email funnel, uh, well, it didn't always convert. So we optimized the email funnel first. And then at a certain point you saw that, yeah, like that, that was nothing before. Yep. It actually turned out to be a super profitable campaign uh, after looking at those science-based, uh, uh, more of a position-based uh, attribution models. Um, and, and then again, like if you, and, and we did do the reverse A-B test, like we did just run the normal ads, like the normal uh, landing page again, to kind of cross-test that again, like, hey, 
are we just is this like is this totally random or is this really just different and yeah and it turned out that you know like just landing it on on or running it on a landing page for a product directly it was too cold it was too much of a cold landing and yeah we did get something with the with with the third party tools that we were using but it was significantly lower so that kind of insight is super valuable and i think it's already like that that's worth the investment to just validated what i do think is um something that i'm not sure about is that data ownership is important um and that is not guaranteed with buying a tool like if you're just stopping to use it then you're losing your data unless you're going to do backups all the time uh, and it's going to be more difficult to catch back on that like it so i would always recommend everybody get your ass on google analytics and get familiar with the data and especially and that's going to be a teaser for next time just in the ga4 <laughs> yeah actually, honestly actually we should probably do a call if you're down with that just on ga4 specifically yeah. sorry my yeah. you're testing um specifically on ga4 just to go into it um i personally like elevar we're using elevar for some of our clients and they set that up and stuff yeah. but that's like a whole new world and i'm still yeah. very i've been in there and i've played around with it but i don't specifically look at it um so yeah, we should definitely, if you're down, we should definitely do a call. Learning curve for us data nerds when we're so used to to Google Analytics, to older systems, even we get older, Justin. I know. I was, we feel... that, I was thinking about that when you were talking earlier. I'm like, there's like 25 years here of these two gray haired guys. Huh. And I was, I was thinking when we first started the call, look at like Google, if you remember 12 years ago, what Google ads looked like, and now <laughs> you compare it almost is the same exact freaking thing like it hasn't even changed really and the yeah. mantles don't change yeah <laughs> so it's just like crazy. But, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll definitely hop on the call for for ga4 and uh i think it's uh it's one of those things that that, that we can we can we can uh, we can catch up i think we just need a you know a couple of uh, i think it's it, you know we just need a level a couple of topics i mean i'm not i'm not i'm not gonna sell uh, to, you know say that i'm an expert yet i, I totally am in that learning curve and I, I do think actually GA4 is also in that learning phase still. Uh, and it's, it's, it's fluid, but it's, it's so much faster, man. It's so much faster. And I like that a lot. <laughs> so do it's, anything, uh, yeah. Do you find anything in GA4 that you can't find in the original one that you're like, oh God, I have to use this to pull this? Uh, well, funnel reporting is set up much more easily. Like it's really easy to just set up specific rules. Uh, you know, like remember, like you have to like to set up the funnel based on your goals and the yep. universal analytics. And that's kind of it. You know, that's it. Uh, but now you can just really make them all dynamic and put segments on it easily. It's that it's and it's again, it's faster, especially if you have large data sets. Um, yep. Right now, you can get away with it for free even if you have reached sample sizes in, 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 in the universal. Um, and I do think the biggest benefit for bigger brands, especially is that it has integrations like privacy. It's, it's, it's all around privacy, right? Where, where, where it's, it's kind of like getting ready for the Google this era. It's going to be it's totally depending on events. Yeah. And um, it's, it's no longer page view based. And then at, the, at that other level, it's also um, injectable with uh, with machine learning, so you can connect with BigQuery for Google. And I'm not the I'm not the data scientist here, but I do know a lot of people who are in the data scientist world that says, "Oh well, we do need that that injection because we we can actually run uh, that data from Google Analytics together with our CRM and then make Damn. beautiful things." So yeah. expensive, like even for we use Supermetrics and. Um, we don't use BigQuery for Supermetrics, but I've played with it. And like our dashboards are just a little, I mean, it takes some of them when we're pulling big stuff, it can take 30 seconds for like doing a create mm -hmm. report or whatever. So I wanted to do yeah. BigQuery because it caches everything and the price yeah. for it for like five clients is like 18. I mean, it's just, it's insane what they want for that thing, man. Yeah. It's crazy. Absolutely. It's not Google cost. That's just the connector. To be able to mm -hmm. The cost on the Google yeah. is cheap, but Supermetrics is just, so yeah, I, uh, so then I play with Databox and just can't get away from Supermetrics just because of the way the dashboards integrate. You just kind of have to give it some time. But that's data ownership, man. Yeah. That's the part. Like, and that's that's also the reason why they exist. It's it's, it's because that their business model. And I totally get it. Like, there's there's convenience, but in return, you get dependence. 
yeah. and that's uh it's it's okay i mean that's it's fine if you can if it's if it's just a marginal piece of the uh, the, the cost puzzle right but i i do get um i do think like on the on the same in the same time you can in, start investing like getting connectors independently from from those uh, systems you can uh, hire uh, somebody who's you know who's got API experience and uh, and and one you know basically what you need to do is SQL like a, get get an SQL de developer that yep. knows how to build up databases or connect them and then obviously first of all you have to ask the question why do I need all that but if you have to find that you just hold it against one two three guys or girls who are specialized yeah. in that and they can they can set up the, now they actually can set up the connectors without any boundaries. Which is much better than you know. I need to have yeah. uh, an API connection with Supermetrics or that kind of stuff. Yeah. But yeah. But it's 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 interesting, uh, especially for us nerds, uh, Justin. I guess that's uh, you know. I'm, I'm not sure if everybody on Athletes is no. like, okay, what what are we talking about now exactly? But it's uh, <laughs> we're getting carried away. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, I appreciate it. We ran 20 minutes overall. I'm gonna hit you up. We'll set up a time for some GA stuff. Um, yeah. For that. Cool. Thank you guys for time. Um, appreciate it. Keep the videos coming, Vincent. Love them. They're awesome. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. If you guys have anything else to add, um, any questions? Um, you need, go well, ahead. maybe we can add that rule. Can you? <laughs> um, next, is it's a sponsor in your group, right? The Geek Out thing. Geek Out, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, they're a sponsor. Yep. Okay, so I can tell that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if anybody from this group is there next week. Um, Ukraine. Uh, I'll be there. So. Anybody hit me up if you're going to be there. Sweet. Yeah, I wish I could travel. <laughs> so I'm not doing Get a it. COVID running. Yeah, well, with kids and stuff, my wife will divorce me if I leave her at home with four kids. <laughs> <laughs> There's another one here that would probably. I feel you, bro. Home. Yeah. School starts this week, too. So I don't know about over there, but school starts tomorrow. So yeah. Cool. Someday. Right, man. Someday when I get them out of the house. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you, uh, you having guys. us on here. Yeah. And uh, take care. You too, man. Talk soon. Yep. Bye. Take care, guys. Bye bye.